By devoting just six minutes each weekday for one year, you can read through the entire New Testament using David Servant's daily devotional, Heaven Word Daily. Order your copy at heavenword.tv. Okay, we have just come to James chapter 4 and verse number 4, where James uses a very, very strong uh, language, calling his readers adulteresses. Something I've already explained that they would have recognized as Old Testament language uh, that is an accusation of idolatry and a divided heart. And, and so James has said, you know, you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. Now we come to verse number 5. and. I have to be honest with you, some of these things, I don't always catch the perfect flow, I don't feel satisfied in my own self, that I fully understand every tidbit of James's progressive logic here. Uh, but yet, uh, and, and that troubles me as a teacher and a guy that wants to understand the Bible, you understand, uh, but I pacify myself oftentimes by saying, well, wait a second, I got the general gist of this. And when you look at the greater context of all the scriptures, rather than trying to just hone in on one expression or one verse, you know, you, you, you feel like you have a, a general idea of what he's saying. And so that's, you've got what's important. Okay, so that's how I'm going to pacify myself and you as we go through these next few verses. Verse number five of James 4. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? And, and then in the New American Standard, it's a quotation, but it's not in caps because you can't find it anywhere in the Old Testament. Quote, he jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. End quote. Oh, oh my goodness. Um, so he's trying to make a strong point here, you know, uh, about we ought to be devoted to God and not friends of the world. And to make the point, he reminds us of a truth that, of course, we all already knew this, that God made his spirit to dwell in us, right? That's pretty simple, basic Christianity 101 type stuff. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. We've talked about that many times here. But now we learn something new, that God jealously desires that spirit which he's made to dwell into us. And as we will read the next verse, and we will, it becomes clear that what he's describing is kind of this tension that, that exists within God. And some theologians and, and, and listeners might object to that, but uh, let me say that there's no other way to say it, and it's true. There is a tension within God. Even though he's perfect and complete in himself and so forth, we see all over the scripture this tension, for example, between God's his justice and his mercy. Right? You know, where those two things are, are not the same thing. They're, they're opposites. And God is a just God, but God is a merciful God. And so there's, you know, a push and shove, it seems, for lack of a better way to say it, between those two things within God. And here we have a case where God gives his spirit to us, but he would, there's, there's a tension, he'd like to not give his spirit to us because he jealously desires that spirit. Now, do I understand that? I don't understand that at all. But James is trying to make a point that, that you know, God has given us a wonderful, amazing gift. Uh, you know, he's given us his spirit. And just so you understand, there's a part of God that would rather not give you his spirit. He'd rather keep it all for himself jealously, you know, rather than sharing his Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? And again, I'm, I can't go much further than that because, you know, I'm running out of uh, intelligence here in understanding it. Because now look, look at the next verse, in verse number six, he says, of James four, but he gives a greater grace. So there's the tension. There's a jealousy that God has to not give us the Holy Spirit, but there's a grace within him that then overrides that jealousy and does give us the Spirit. But the message to us is we have, as James said, or excuse me, as Paul said, this treasure in earthen vessels. We've got the Holy Spirit in us and naturally he's given to help us to be holy and to walk the narrow road that leads to eternal life. <laughs> okay, and so wake up. What are you doing pursuing the world when, when God, you know, is so much more worthy of your devotion and love and attention? In fact, he's given you this amazing gift to help you in your love and your devotion for him and, and, your, and your ability to please him. He's given you, we can say this way, himself, his Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, to use a theological uh, terminology there. 
you know? And it's not because we deserve it, it's because God's grace, and that grace has overcome jealousy within God that would motivate him not to give us the Holy Spirit. What an amazing, profound thought. You know, again, don't try to comprehend it. Just believe it. Wow. And so, therefore, and that's a good place for therefore, James goes on to say, because of all this, here's what you should do. Uh, um, well, he says, excuse me, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, and now he does quote, and this is in caps because it is found a couple of places in the Old Testament. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So God in his grace gives the Holy Spirit to who? Only to the humble. And when you humble yourself and repent and cry out to God, that's when you are given the Holy Spirit. And I think there's evidence in Scripture that there are subsequent fillings of the Holy Spirit, and that we can ask for the Holy Spirit even as believers who are already been received the Holy Spirit, but it requires a humbling of ourselves. And just like repentance and humility is what motivated God to overcome his jealousy the first time to give us his Holy Spirit, that same thing can work again in the life of a Christian who, you know, needs to repent once again and to receive God's grace and also to receive some more of the Holy Spirit. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So do you want grace from God? You know, you got to be humble, and that—that's. I, I can't resist in the 50 seconds that I have left in this in this uh, time together to point out to you that so oftentimes grace is presented in, in a in a in an unbiblical manner. Uh, it's presented as if God offers grace unconditionally, because if it's not unconditional, it can't be grace. They say. But is that a true according to the Bible? Not according to the verse we just read, which quotes a couple of verses in the Old Testament. God gives grace to the humble. So his grace is conditioned upon the humility uh, of those who potentially could uh, be bestowed with some of his grace, right? That is irrefutable, incontrovertible, you know, can't be argued against. Okay, all right, well, good. We're out, just about out of time, so we'll get back into this when we get back together. See you next time. Heavenward 7 is made possible by the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you.